January 1861 Historical Background Lincoln has won the November 1860 election from a field of four candidates. He has received less than 40% of the popular vote, mainly from the free states. The Republican Party nominated him on an anti-slavery expansion platform. As a result, seven southern states will declare the secession from the Union before his inauguration as president on March 4, 1861. In a fragile, very small envelope, two letters on the same folded paper written to a cousin, addressed to Mr. Stuart Taylor, Sodus Center, Wayne County, New York. Three-cent stamp, his hand marked off, dated January 6, 1861. Letters written in pen and good penmanship, a few words with unusual spellings, so unclear. The cousins writing the letters are Sarah A. Jennings and Stephen Jennings, living in North Collins. North Collins is a small town south of Buffalo, New York, near Lake Erie. January 6, 1861. North Collins. Dear Cousin, It is a long time since we received your letter, but I hope that you will not be offended at us for not answering it sooner. I shall not try to excuse the matter at all, for I shall only make it worse. We are well at present. Aunt Isabella is failing slowly. She has been a considerably better, but she is not near as well now. The rest of their folks are well. Alestra and her children are well, and her folks are as well as usual. I think that it will not do for you to come up here again, for we are so lonesome after you go away. And not only us, but some of the girls fall in love with you, and of course they felt bad to have you leave. You may think I am joking, but I am not. And I think that if you want a wife, there is a good chance to get one here. We have not had a squirrel since you left here. I think that you had better send us up one or something just as good. I am not particular. We are going to have a roasted goose this week. I think you had better come up and help eat it. There has been a good slaying here for six weeks. Well, I guess that I have written my part. I will let Stephen finish. I had to commence it or it would not have been written. I hope that you will not write us long as we have before. Before you write, give my love to Lucinda and inquiring friends. In the margin, she finishes with these words. Tell Lucinda to write to me if she will. Write soon and often. Sarah A. Jennings Next two folded pages on folded paper. Well, cousin, I think I must write a few yarns to you. You and everybody was going for Lincoln. I guess you are right. Mink is scarce here. Deer are plenty. If you would like to catch one, you must come up here. The elder has one. Rodney is here, right side up with care. Samuel and Helen is to Fords this winter. There was a donation to the elders about the time we received your letter. We had a good time, I tell you. Ford says there has been a great harvest here of little ones. Tell you that is good news. The girls send their love to you, MF especially. So goodbye right soon. I will try to do better the next time. Signed, Stephen Jennings. Then he goes on to write more. I must write a little more, cousin. I have not trapped any this winter. It is raining now. The wind whistles around the house. Hannah is snoring. Sarah is scolding about the fire and Skip barks and I am trying to write. It will be all right in the spring when the logs come down. It is all right now on the square. Stuart, you may think I went up on a slab last fall. I guess not. I will stay a little longer. If I could see you, I would tell you the rest of the yarn. It is hard talking on paper. Is the state of your mind able to be about it as you write? How did you, how did you spend Christmas and New Year's? Stuart, I wish you was out here to sing Angelina while I, I donate. We have giggled and laughed till there is no feeling to our mouth. Good night, SJ. And he finishes, no more to offer.
Historic notes from this letter. Stuart Taylor, who lives in Soda Center, is a ladies' man, or at least the cousins seem to think so. Sarah Jennings seems to be chatty in her letter and better able to communicate on paper. Stephen seems to be interested in hunting, trapping, and telling yarns in a backwoodsy sort of way. When Stephen speaks of donations and donating, he is apparently referring to contributing food to a barn dance or party. The song Angelina that Stephen refers to is Angelina Baker, a popular song by Stephen Foster written in 1850. It was a minstrel song. Way down on the old plantation, there's where I was born. I used to beat the whole creation, hoeing in the corn. Oh, then I'd work and then I'd sing so happy all the day. Till Angelina Baker came and stole my heart away. Angelina Baker, Angelina Baker's gone. She left me here to weep the tear and beat on the old jawbone. Angelina Baker, Angelina Baker's gone. She left me here to weep the tear and beat on the old jawbone. The Civil War was America's bloodiest conflict. An estimated 620,000 men lost their lives in the line of duty, roughly 2% of the population. Taken as a percentage of today's population, the total would have risen as high as 6 million souls. Military deaths during the Civil War were equivalent to all other American wars combined. One little known fact is that during the Civil War, for every three soldiers killed in battle, five more died of disease. Approximately one in four soldiers that went to war never returned home. The Battle of Yorktown or Siege of Yorktown was fought from April 5th to May 4th, 1862 as part of the Peninsula Campaign of the American Civil War. Marching from Fort Monroe, Union Major General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac encountered Major General John Magruder's small Confederate force at Yorktown behind the Warwick Line. McClellan suspended his march up the peninsula towards Richmond and settled in for siege operations. On April 5th, the 4th Corps of Brigadier General Erasmus Keyes made initial contact with Confederate defensive works at Lee's Mill, an area McClellan expected to move through without resistance. Magruder's movements of troops back and forth convinced the Federals that his works were strongly held. As the two armies fought an artillery duel, reconnaissance indicated to Keyes the strength and breadth of the Confederate fortifications, and he advised McClellan against assaulting them. McClellan ordered the construction of siege fortifications and brought his heavy siege guns to the front. In the meantime, General Joseph Johnson of the Confederacy bought reinforcement for McCruger. On April 16th, Union forces probed a point in the Confederate lines at Dam No. 1. The Federals failed to exploit the initial success of this attack, however. This lost opportunity held up McClellan for two additional weeks while he tried to convince the U.S. Navy to bypass the Confederates' big guns at Yorktown and Gloucester Point and ascend the York River to West Point and outflank the Warwick Line. McClellan planned a massive bombardment for dawn on May 5th, but the Confederate Army slipped away during the night of May 3rd towards Williamsburg. The battle took place near the site of the 1781 Siege of Yorktown, the final battle of the American Revolutionary War in the East. The two April 1862 letters are both in one envelope. The envelope is a small, faded white one addressed to Mr. Stuart Taylor, Soda Center, Wayne County, New York. It has a three-cent stamp in the right-hand corner. It is postmarked old, then we can't read the rest, April 30th, 
Virginia. This could be Old Point Comfort, Virginia. The first letter is really a short note or cover letter included with the main longer letter. It is written on small white lined paper and is only the front and a little on the back. It is neatly and well written in pen. It is written to Fran Stewart and signed only with what I am guessing is a nickname L-Y-M Lime. This could be uh, shortened for the name Lyman. There was a Lyman Rogers who had enlisted in the same company at the same time in Lyons. It was not unusual for men to enlist in the neighboring towns. The letter is written from Camp Winfield Scott which was the headquarters of General George McClellan located near Yorktown, Virginia in April 1862. Camp Scott, April 27th. Friend Stewart, I left Charlie at our old camp last Thursday and he gave the letter enclosed to me of the boys to mail and he has neglected to do so and so I am going to mail it in the morning. I write this to tell you that our post office address is changed so that when you answer it you will direct to Company F, 98th Regiment, Washington, D.C. Yours in haste, line. P.S. We are within one mile of the enemy's lines and do not know at what moment we may be called to march to Yorktown. We sleep on our arms all the time. If did you get my letter and have answered it, do so again as I shall never get it because I did not give you the right direction. Minnie is quite sick but not dangerous. All the rest of the boys are well. And it's signed, Lime. The second longer letter in this same envelope is a four-page letter well written in fancy script with a pen and a large, approximately 12 inches by 15 inches, lined numbered paper that appears to have been meant to be used for regiment record keeping. It is from his friend Charlie, who I believe is Charles H. Steger spelled S-T-E-A-G-E-R or S-T-E-E-G-E-R. You'll see he refers to Stuart by a nickname Toot. Charlie is sick and apparently has been for quite a while. Many at this time had typhoid fever or dysentery. He's not at a hospital but too weak to fight so left at camp. Newport News, Virginia, April 1862. Friend 2. Your letter has been in my pocket ever since I received it. You will pardon me for my seeming neglect. It was not intentional. Circumstances have made such delay unavoidable. I will endeavor in my poor way, however, to make up for all this. When visions of home come before me, the contrast with my personal situation are painful indeed. But there I think that sooner or later I shall again taste the joys of home and the companionship of friends left there, and you, my friend, have a large share of my thoughts. I do not wish to encourage these thoughts, for they partake of homesickness, and that will never do for a soldier to indulge in. You have probably read or heard from letters to my folks, that I have been sick and have not quite recovered from the effects of it. Such is the case, but it gives me a greater chance of observing things in general around me. I cannot tell you much on this paper, but if ever I get back, you will hear some blowing, I bet. Many and the others I have not seen for over a week. They moved from here the 17th of April. I do not know how far they are from us now, perhaps 25 miles. The baggage wagons come back two or three times a week after the stores which were left here with us. It is through these that I am enabled to send and receive letters. If we could stay here in our present situation with the consideration of being able to act independently as at home, or in other words, if we do not belong to the army and subject to restrictions, it would be bearable. And in fact, as it is, we do not complain for complaints are useless here. You see we are resigned. As for me, if I had my health and strength, 
I would be comparatively happy, for the soldier's life has a charm, yes, many of them, allowing a person to be able to be about and able to discharge his duties. I shall probably fail to write anything interesting to you, but you know you need not read only such parts as you choose to. Oh, you were here with a good double-barreled shotgun. You and I would go to the river and bring in a lot of ducks, quails, clams, oysters, and all such kinds of insects for a good dinner. But I am too weak to carry any gun, and if I could, I would not dare to shoot away the cartridges, for I must account for my forty. This morning it was rather cool, so we built a fire at our camp stove as we be trying the merits of a kettle of bean soup. The tent caught fire and burned a hole large enough to crawl through before we succeeded in putting out the flames. So we have it well ventilated here, you see. He has drawn a sketch with details of the tent and the fire. There was one thing decidedly cheering us on a pleasant and still evening. That is the brass bands of the various regiments quartered at Newport News, which is one mile from here. The music can be heard plainly and just enough distinctness to make it sound agreeable. Oh, who would not be a soldier? Here is one that wouldn't if he couldn't, but he is game yet. Don't mind this print. I commence below. He has written this on the typed print that is on the regiment paper, which we can presume is the only paper available to him to write home on. Here I am again, and I must try to fill out the sheet whether you read it or not. We expect to hear news from Yorktown every day. That will be one blood battle. Say four times the number who fought there in the Revolution are engaged on both sides, each determined to make a struggle, and a struggle it will be. I wish heartily that I was able to be with the boys on that day when they will shout victory from the winds of the enemy's breastworks, but I am here, and here I expect to stay for an indefinite period. Though I would wish the doctor would discharge me or give me a furlough long enough to regain my health, either would suit well enough. The hot days kill me and make me so weak, I can hardly get up and down. The fact is, the climate that proves fatal to so many does not agree with me at all. And, what is worse, I cannot get toughened to it. It is worse and worse every day. But pluck is the thing we live on it, and when we are sick it is fed us as medicine. Those who are blessed with a larger portion than others are the most liable to recover. Toot, you said you had left your violin at father's and thought of leaving it there until I came home. I hope you will do so. Yes, by that means you will be here to visit my folks occasionally, and that is what I want, and again, the time may not be far distant from when I may be there to assist in a few tunes. With God's help, I shall be home before fall. Now, if Father's folks should be sick, I would ask you to do what you can to assist them, and will remunerate you so you will lose nothing by this act of friendship. Lyman wants me to ask you if you received his letter. I must now close after asking you to give my respects to all the boys whom I know and reserve a large stock for yourself. Believe me to be your most devoted friend, Charlie, Company F, 98th Regiment, 2nd Brigade, Fortress Monroe, Old Point, Virginia. When Charles mentions that he must account for his 40, he is talking about the 40 cartridges issued to each soldier. 40 cartridges filled a soldier's ammo pouch. Historic research shows that Charles H. Steger and Lyman Rogers mustered in to the Union troops in Lyons, New York on November 14, 1861. Charles was 21 and Lyman was 23. Charles H. Steger was enlisted as a private and promoted to corporal. He died July 10, 1862 at Baltimore, Maryland, just two months after this letter. We presume he died from the illnesses he mentions in his letter. Lyman Rogers was wounded at Cold Harbor, Virginia, and died July 10, 1864, two years to the day after Charles died. 
Sadly, neither one of these friends ever made it back home. Historic Notes, September 1864. The Copperheads were a minority vocal faction of Democrats located in the northern United States of the Union who opposed the American Civil War, wanting an immediate settlement with the Confederates. Republicans started calling anti-war Democrats Copperheads, likening them to the venomous snake. The Peace Democrats accepted the label, reinterpreting the copper head as the likeness of liberty, which they cut from copper pennies and proudly wore as badges. Far more numerous than the Copperheads, however, were those folks who did not support slavery, but also did not feel that the cost in human life was worth putting an end to it. In March 1863, the Civil War was in its third year, and Union battle losses were exceeding the number of men volunteering. An act for enrolling and calling out the national forces was signed into law on March 3, 1863, by President Abraham Lincoln. This, the first effective draft by the federal government, called for all men between the ages of 18 and 45 to be enrolled into local militia units and be available to be called into national service. The actual drafting of the men was the responsibility of the states, which usually used a lottery system. When the government issued a call for more troops, each state would be given a quota to fill based on its population. The number of volunteers would be subtracted from the quota and the difference would be drafted. A draftee could obtain an exemption by paying a fee of $300 or by hiring a substitute. The obvious inequity of this provision prompted the cry of rich man's war but poor man's fight. The draft law was not well received. On July 13, 1863, a massive draft riot began in New York City. Before the rioting was contained by bringing in federal troops, hundreds would die and property damage would be between 15 and 75 million dollars in today's money. It is a little known fact that between July 1863 and December 1864, 161,224 men failed to report to service under the draft. Many draft dodgers would simply relocate to western states or Canada. Others hid in their local community, which often supported them. With the draft law still not providing the number of troops needed, by September 1864 the government began offering enlistment bounties, which were often several times the typical annual wage and would vary from town to town. New York State offered some of the most lucrative bounties. The next Civil War time letter is from a nephew, Elmer, in Soda Center to his uncle, J.S. Taylor, who is presently in Langford, Erie County, New York. It seems Stewart is in Erie County at this time to help out a cousin. It is dated September 6, 1864. The nephew is encouraging the uncle to come to Soda's area to enlist to get the $1,300 bounty offered in Lyons. Of course, he tells other family and friend news as well, such as who is sick and who has recently enlisted. It is written on a folded, lined, white, three-and-a-half page paper in a yellowed envelope. There's a three-cent stamp in the left-hand corner and upside down with a pencil X on the stamp. The post office cancellation stamp is Soda Center, September 7th. The letter is written in very fancy pen script. Elmer is calling his uncle by a nickname Toot, his real name being John Stuart Taylor. When the names Uncle Mai and Uncle Chan are mentioned, I believe these would be Myron and Chandler. Aldous is Aldous W. Brower, a cousin, I believe. Soda Center, September 6th, 1864. Dear Uncle, your kind and welcome letter reached here in due season. Found us all well. 
First, I will tell you who has enlisted. Well, here goes. Wal Harris, Joe Clark, Charlie Woolley, Billy Wamsvalder. These is all I can think of. They were credited to Lyons instead of Sodus. There pays more bounty than this town. They pay $1,300 for one year. Just think of that, Toot. Is that not a great inducement only for a year? Just think once Sodus pays $1,100 for the same time, one year. The boys are going in the 9th Artillery, Company J. There is nothing said about the draft nowadays. The state militia met and organized yesterday at Sodus Commander's Tinkle Ponds Company comes in now. Toot, you had better skedaddle down here and go in for this $1,300 for one year and $16 per month. You can't earn that any other way as easy. Uncle Mai and Uncle Cham talked strong of going, and I too now come on and going and get the $1,300 right in your fist as soon as you are mustered in. I see Wal Harris last night. He said he saw a fellow in Auburn the other day right from the regiment, and he said the boys had enlisted in a good time for the regiment was on its way back to Washington. It is now on Boulevard Heights in Maryland. The last they heard from Aldous, he had the ag a little. Aunt Meta says tell you that she wrote you about two weeks since. They say that there is about 40 gone to Canada from this town. I believe if they know what bounties they were offering, they would skedaddle back again. Don't you believe so, Toot? Now come down and see and hear for yourself. Don't forget to come. The folks are all well, but Aunt Louisa, she is quite sick with fever. Doc Sprake tells her from Williamson. I say now is the time to go and see Aldous and Jack and all the, the boys. Well, I guess I have written near news enough, so I will say one or two more words. Ma says, tell Cuz Ford she will write to him very soon if she don't forget it. I say, come down here, Toot. Love to all. Goodbye from your nephew, Elmer. Historic notes from this letter. Elmer mentions in this letter that they say that there are about 40 gone from this town to Canada. It is unclear if that number is from Sodus Center or the town of Sodus. Either way, however, there is a significant number of draft dodgers. It is also apparent that the bounty incentive equaling several years pay is inducing many local men to enlist. April 1865 Historical Background On the morning of April 9, 1865, at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, General Robert E. Lee surrenders to General Ulysses S. Grant, bringing an end to the Civil War after four years of bloody combat. It is a testament to the greatness of Abraham Lincoln that the next day, as crowds gather outside the White House to celebrate, Lincoln requested that the band plays Dixie. Learning that Lincoln was to attend Laura Keene's acclaimed performance of Our American Cousin at Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. on April 14th, John Wilkes Booth, himself a well-known actor at the time, masterminded the simultaneous assassination of Lincoln, Vice President Andrew Johnson, and Secretary of State William H. Seward. By murdering the President and two of his possible successors, Booth and his co-conspirators, including Mary and John Surratt, hoped to throw the U.S. government into disarray. At 10.15 p.m. that evening, Booth fatally shot Lincoln. Another co-conspirator, Lewis Powell, entered the Seward home and severely wounded Seward, Seward's son Frederick, and a bodyguard. William H. Seward would re eventually recover from his wounds. Another co-conspirator, George Asterod, was assigned to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson, but lost his nerve and stayed in the hotel bar drinking instead. The next are two letters in a small yellow envelope, about three inches by five inches. 
The envelope is addressed to Mr. John S. Taylor, Langford, Erie County, New York. You see that Stewart is not living in Soda Center, but in Erie County, New York, south of Buffalo. It is postmarked from Soda Center, New York, April 21st. Even though the envelope is addressed to John S. Taylor, he is called Stewart in the letters. The first two-page letter is from Stewart's ten-and-a-half-year-old nephew, Edward C. Delano, living in Soda Center in April 1865. Soda Center, April 20th, 1865. Dear Uncle, received your letter of the second, but have not had time to answer it before, and being what Ma was going to write, I thought I would. I am well, and hope these few lines will find you the same. Pa has seen Mr. Pillar. He says that the chest may stay there. I could not make out that puzzle that you sent me in that letter. Everybody but copperheads and snakes has been rejoicing over the capture of Lee's army and Richmond, and now they are crying about the death of our president, and about Frederick and W.H. Seward being stabbed. They are both getting better. They have got the one that shot Lincoln, his name is Booth, and have got the one that stabbed the Seward. His name is Surratt. You make a long stay. I think you better come home and see your mama who takes snuff. You had better bring me some maple sugar or I will bust your comber stable. I am getting savage nowadays. Mrs. Bowman keeps house for Uncle Edward. She keeps hubby with her. Uncle Edward has got a set line on the pond hub and I tend it. Yesterday we got three eels and seven bullheads. This morning we got four walleyes. Well, I must bring my letter to a close and goodbye from your nephew, E.C. Delano, Sotus, New York. You might have noticed in this letter read, uh, written by this 10-year-old boy that he did have most of his historic facts correct, but he did say that the Surratts had stabbed the Sewards. This was not accurate. The second letter in that same envelope was from this young boy's mother, who is Stuart's sister, and her name is Almeida. She also lives in Soda Center. April 20th, 1865, Soda Center, Wednesday morning, 9 o'clock. Dear brother, we received your kind and welcome letter in due time. Was glad to hear from you again. Glad to hear, hear that you were alive and well, except a bad cold. Hope that is better now. We were sorry to learn that Cousin Ford is so feeble, hoping he may feel better when warm weather comes again and Isabella will be better. Oh, Stuart, it is a solemn time about here and the whole country around on the dreadful event that has happened to our nation, the great loss of our president. But we must be submissive. I want to tell you about those letters. There has been two letters came here to this office for you, and I put them each in an envelope and sent them to you. One was in a yellow one in a white envelope. Have you got them? Please let me know. Mind I put the letters just as they came. Did not open either of them into another envelope and sent them to you. I wrote on the first about Lewis Reynolds' grist mill burning down. I sent the first nine weeks ago, the last two weeks ago. You wish to know what Chandler was a doing. He is to work shoveling out and drying out dirt, fixing the place to build Lewis's new mill on. That is getting it ready to lay the foundation. Chandler took the job. He is to have it done. Ready to lay the wall by the 5th of May. Lewis gives him $250 to do it. It is a hard job and a dirty one, too. Chandler thinks he will have it done in time if he has good weather. Lewis wants Chandler to stay with him and keep right on to work for him. You know, Stuart, according to the bargain, his time is out, agreeing to work as long as Lincoln was president. My mind is so confused. I can't think of much news to write to you. 
Chandler talked, you must have been some tired when you got back to Ford's after selling your potatoes. He said it was worth five dollars to take them to market. Well, our folks are all well as usual. Mary is sad not hearing from Aldous for two weeks past. Well, I must close by wishing you was here. You spoke of going to the oil mines in Eddie's letter and wanting to know who had gone. No one has gone, and don't you go, Stuart. But come, or write soon. Almedia Delano. Then she proceeds to write a bit more, sideways, in the margins. I think you had better come back home when you get done there, for there's lots of work here to do, Stuart. We are going to have some veal for dinner. Wish you was here. You make a long two or three weeks. When you come, bring some maple sugar. Chandler has seen Gillette about your tool chest. He says it can stay there as well as not, Stuart. Come when you get done soon. The next letter is in a small 3 by 5 inch dirty white envelope with a red 3 cent stamp. Addressed to Mr. Stuart Taylor, Langford, Erie County, New York. Postmarked from Newark, New York. This letter is written on April 30th, 1865, very soon after Lincoln was killed, and she mentions that in the letter. This is written by a lady, Matilda Clum or Clem, who is living in Newark and working there, but knows and may go back to Sodus. Stuart is a friend. It is written in a very small, neat, cursive writing. Newark, Sunday, April 30th, 1865. Dear friend Stuart, I received your letter some time ago, and now after a long delay, I will try to answer it. I have so much to do since I came home that I don't have hardly time to sit. I came home the 10th of March in a snowstorm. I am well and enjoying myself as well as can be expected here along so, so much sick. I suppose you have your sugar made and eat up by this time. I've a good hand to tend the sap, but not so good at chopping. I have been to three dances since that one we attended to. We have very nice spring weather. It has been quite an exciting time around here to hear that President Lincoln was shot, and I suppose it was throughout the state. But Mr. Booth did not live long after Mr. Lincoln's death. They say that the war is about to a close. I hope it is, for I think that it has been blood enough shed by the battlefield for one cruel war hoping that the boys that is left on the battlefield may come home rejoicing. The folks around here are all well. Delilah D. Simmons is tending school at Sodus. I, don't, I think that you are acquainted with the Sodus. If you are not, I hope that you will excuse me for writing so. It is nothing going on here now but work, and that is something that I don't like but have to do my share of it. Our singing school is out. Last Wednesday night was the last, so I don't know where to go now. I guess that I will go back to Sodus again. Lou has been sitting thinking. He is through sitting. He has put in about three acres this spring. Well, I guess that I had better stop writing, for if I don't, I will have to tell you as you tell me. If I can't read it, bring it back to me, and I will read it for you. So you see that I had no trouble with yours at all. Yours truly, from Miss Matilda Clem or Clum to Mr. John Stewart Taylor. Write and let me know if I direct this letter right.